Good morning, family of God. J.P. Greer here from the Sentinels for Christ on this March 22nd, 2024 for your SFC 20 in the Word Friday Bible Study. I bless you in the name of Jesus. We are in the fifth chapter of the letter of John to the churches, and we're coming close to being done this book that we've walked through together. And it's really been a book that is a powerful book and a powerful testimony written by the Apostle John who walked with Jesus, who was there with him, who was one of the few apostles who was at the cross, we're told in the Gospels when Jesus died, and was one of the first apostles to go to the tomb, and we're told the first at least male apostle that believed when he looked in that tomb and saw Jesus' body wasn't there anymore. It's that John that wrote this letter that we're looking at today. And we're looking at a piece of scripture that um, is a little bit complex. Um, sometimes it promotes a little bit of confusion. So we'll give you a, a spread on that today. And I think you'll be blessed. There'll be no more confusion on this section of scripture in the name of Jesus. Um, but I just want to welcome um, the new members who have chosen to follow us this week at Sentinels for Christ. And uh, it's my favorite time to do this because they're from all over the planet. Do you know that we have a ministry that has footprints in probably 90% of the countries on the face of the earth? But it, it, to try and generate a database to follow over 61,000 people would be next to impossible. But I get messages and have people tuning into our services, our prayer services, special events, and Bible studies all the time. And I just bless you in the name of Jesus. I promise you in the name of Jesus. I will make this a safe place for you to learn about Jesus, whether or not you know him already and you're going deeper, or whether or not you're checking out the Christian faith because someone is, has told you about Jesus, or maybe you had a dream and God started um, bringing Jesus and who Jesus is to you. You saw something in the dream and that led you to, to a, a journey of trying to discover who Jesus is. This is a safe place to learn about him. Why? Because we focus on Jesus and we try and not get caught up in the distractions that sometimes church world gets distracted in. So let's welcome our new members um, just this week. Wish me luck um, on pronouncing their names. I want to uh, just welcome uh, Tempa Tope from the United States. Welcome Tempa Tope. Um, that may be Tempa Tope, okay, from the uh, great state of Idaho. I love it when people from the United States follow us. Um, Annis from Morocco, I bless you, uh, Annis. Do you know that we have gotten so many requests um, to know more about Jesus from Arabic-speaking uh, countries and that, that we've developed a, a very quick way of responding to them and giving them uh, the gospel and, and telling them about Jesus in Arabic. And I realize that there may be a lot of people who may be from Islam and they want to know how Christians represent Jesus, so they're wanting answers to that question intellectually, but I also know that there are a lot of people from um, the Arabic-speaking worlds that, just like all over the uh, rest of the world, Jesus is reaching out to people. Do you know the Bible says that God calls men and women from all nations, every nation, okay, is going to be in heaven represented. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes we just think that, oh, only the people who think like us are going to be there, or dress like us, or look like us. Thank God that isn't true. Heaven would be very dull if it was that way. But there are going to be people from every nation. And then finally, I want to welcome Ar Arjan from Afghanistan. Boy, there's a Persian-speaking country, and it's tough to be a Christian in Afghanistan. I bless you, brother. Um, and, and may you be uh, blessed by what we do here in the name of Jesus. Um, so we're in the fifth chapter of the Epistle of John, and we're just going to tackle a few small verses today. Remember, th this book written by John was John near the end of his life. He's probably the only apostle left alive. And looking back after he's been a Christian for all this time, John is, is probably um, between 85 to 90 years old when he wrote this. He, he has a perspective on the faith and he wants to reinforce the main things of the Christian faith, which really are uh, the centralities of what is fake Christian faith. And it's just religion. Because John knows there's a lot of people who talk about Jesus and they're simply not saved, okay? 
And he, he gives some tests or some ways of identifying that in his book for two reasons. One, so that we're wise about who we fellowship with, okay? But the second more, more encouraging reason is so that we have these ways of looking at our own faith and assessing or coming to a conclusion or seeing our own faith for what it is. Is it authentic? Okay, does it need work? Um, are, are we operating in spiritual hypocrisy? And those two ways that John really repeats over and over again are that people who say they follow Jesus don't keep sinning. Okay, he says it repeatedly. And if someone says that they follow Jesus and they have a just, it, their sin life never stops, they're non transformed. Okay, not only is behavioral sin rampant in their life, but they're really not interested in glorifying Jesus in their life. You have every reason to suspect they're not a Christian. Okay. The second one that John says is real Christians are identified by how they treat one another and how they love one another. It's interesting he says that because actually a lot of the, the, the spiritual truth principle, strongest statements that John makes in this letter are the statements that Jesus made at the end of his life, either around the table at the last Passover he had or between the Passover and his death on the cross. We're going to get to one of those circumstances today. So it's really those two things. But he has some things to say in the fifth chapter as he winds down this letter that um, are going to bless us today. So let's jump right in, okay? And remember that he started this fifth chapter talking about overcoming the world and saying that, hey, we have overcome the world because of our faith. Meaning, we, we are not run down by the world, we're not controlled by the world because of our reliance on God. And we talk about that a lot at Sentinels for Christ. The word faith can always be replaced, okay? Probably 95% of the time in the New Testament as trust in God. So if you're reading your Bible and you're confused about what Jesus is saying when he's talking about stuff like if you had faith to do, to do this, if you replace the word faith with trust in God, trust me, what he is saying um, or what one of the New Testament writers is saying, it's going to make more sense, okay? But John is starting this last fifth chapter talking about our great faith. And we have a great faith because we have an irrefutable undeniable, okay, perfectly reliable testimony that we're going to talk about today, and it's going to bless you. Let's start reading from John chapter 5, verse 5, where he says, Who is it that has overcome the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus Christ is God. Woo! Verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood. John's now referring to Jesus, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by blood. That's kind of a strange statement. Don't worry, we'll get to it. And it is the Spirit, capital S, meaning the Holy Spirit in your Bible, who testifies. Because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, capital S, meaning the Holy Spirit, the blood, and the water, and these three are in agreement. Let's talk about that small section of Scripture today about why these three things testify to testify the water, the Spirit, and the blood in a way where you have clarity about this section of scripture so that you're not confused when you run into it. Because let me tell you, as a young Christian, wow, did I spend a lot of time confused on what was being said here. So while this is complex and it, it does promote some confusion, I'm gonna give you the, uh, 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 the general acceptance of really two um, positions of what this means, okay? And whether or not you believe in one or the other or a combination of both, you're in good company. You're okay. Because the men who have taught that, they are reliable Bible teachers of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have a couple um, that, that I follow um, from my upbringing in, in my Christian faith who are just solid, reliable um, uh, Bible teachers. Both of them have gone home to be with the Lord, but they were solid men. And they taught... 
Bible the way that, that, that I have adopted as teaching the Bible pretty much verse by verse, okay, so that we bring those great scriptural truth um, principles together. But what John is, is saying that is who has overcome the world? Well, he connects it in verse 5. The only person who's overcome the world is the one who believes that Jesus Christ is God. That really has two important points to take from it. Because if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is from God, okay, you have lost your power to overcome the world. And the world will push you, the world will dominate you, and your priorities will be worldly priorities. Now, John talked about those issues in the second chapter of this book when he talked about what stops people from spiritual growth was the focus or the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. If you do not believe in Jesus as the Son of God, there goes your power right there. Why is that? Because Jesus taught that when we believe in, believe in him as the Son of God, okay, and the remedy for sin, that the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to us, and with the Holy Spirit comes power, okay? This is a New Testament spiritual truth principle that's taught from the beginning of the New Testament to the other. So you ought to immediately be thinking of, wow, do I have Holy Spirit power in my life? <clears throat> And if you don't, it's two reasons. Mainly, and I believe the reason is, is that we probably just haven't grown up in maturity to our understanding of the Holy Spirit because people who didn't understand the Holy Spirit taught us. And this, uh, the, the, probably the less common uh, reason is, is that we don't have the Holy Spirit in us yet, which means we have not been reconciled to God by belief in Jesus Christ. Here's the good news. If that's you attached to this today, is a short eight minute video to tell you how to get right with God and saved in Jesus Christ, okay? It'll be all taken care of, really easy. But John starts in verse five saying that if you wanna overcome the world, you have to believe in Jesus as God. And then he says, this is the one who comes to testify. And why does John talk about overcoming the world and belief in Jesus Christ and then saying that there are three following that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And in fact, the order that he gives those in, which is relatively important today, um, it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth, verse 6. And then there's the testimony of the water and the blood. So let's talk about the Spirit. Why? Because I, it's what I just said. That word in your Bible for Spirit, it doesn't mean spiritual things, okay? It's referring to the first personal pronoun. It's referring to a person, okay? The Holy Spirit, meaning that the testifying of Jesus as God, which is reliable, comes from the Holy Spirit. I'm going to bless you right now, okay? Because many people don't believe in miracles. The miracle that many of you believe that Jesus Christ was God, or I mean is God, it, that's a miracle. It is a testimony of the Holy Spirit within you. Why do we know that? Because John just said it in his epistle that the first testimony that Jesus Christ is the Son of God comes from the Holy Spirit. So if you believe that Jesus is God, welcome to the family of God. It means the Holy Spirit is already operating within you because that truth, which is the spirit of truth, okay, can only come from God the Father giving the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is really um, a spiritual truth principle which is taught and was taught directly from the mouth of Jesus himself, okay? And the testimony of the Spirit is this, because Jesus said it in John 15, verse 26, when he said, when the Advocate comes, okay? And this is the last night before Jesus is arrested. 15th chapter of John, verse 26. When the Advocate comes, that word can be translated Spirit to, because those words are interchangeable when Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. When the advocate comes, whom is the spirit of truth, Jesus told his disciples sitting around that table, he will testify of me, which means Holy Spirit is the testifier of who? Jesus Christ. That's why John is saying this and reminding the Christians about it. But the second testimony is this the water and the blood, really the two testimonies. I want to talk about the blood first, okay? Because the blood is a little bit complex, but it'll bless you. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach into, there's many places in the New Testament I could reach into and talk about the blood as a testimony. But we're just going to go into the writing of Peter, his epistle to the churches in the first chapter for a place in scripture, which I think is a great explanation of why John is saying the blood is a testimony of Jesus also, okay? In the first chapter of Peter, verses 18 and 19, we read the following. For you know that it was not with perishable things which fade away like gold or silver that you were redeemed, meaning you were bought, you were reconciled uh, uh, with God from this empty way of life. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. So Peter is reminding the Christians it, that he is writing to at the time he wrote his epistle that the reminder of their redemption, the faith that they live in, is connected to the blood of Christ. Why is that? Because the blood of Jesus is not like my blood. My blood, while I've been saved because of my belief in Jesus, is still attached to a body that will die. My flesh body is still underneath the curse of sin. That's why it will die. Because with God, only perfection can exist. So when I pass from this life to the next life, I will no longer have this flesh body but I will have a spiritual body. Now, don't get confused because many of you are thinking that, what does that look like? Well, it's very clear what the spiritual body looks like because when Jesus rose from the dead, he was able to physically appear, walk through walls, appear and, uh, and, and move and, trans, uh, and translate or travel over great distances in a body that both could be attached in the spiritual realm and attached in the material realm. So we were, we're going to have a new body that is completely different. And the reason is, is because the blood in this body, okay, which the Bible tells us, follow me closely, the Bible teaches that the life of a human being is attached to its blood. And there is something supernatural about the blood that pumps through us, that goes through the heart, that the blood carries oxygen to us and keeps us alive. That is not only representative of the Holy Spirit living in you, I bless you in Jesus name, but it is actual spiritual at the same time. So the Holy Spirit residing in you pumps through who you are like your blood does, okay? And in Jesus, his blood was not tainted by any sin because he was sinless. So that blood of Jesus is the perfect testimony of a resurrected life and the restored life of men and women and how they will be in the next life. That's the testimony of the blood. And when that blood was shed on the cross and fell and went down those members of the cross and dripped off of Jesus' wrists, okay, dripped off of his feet, and collided and came in contact with the earth. I am convinced that spiritually that the earth itself was anointed and the testimony of that perfect blood was a testimony that shot out um, amongst all over the earth so that when physical human beings walk on earth and are attached to that blood testimony, that the testimony of Jesus screams to men and women and says, I'm the savior of the world. Now, you have probably never had that teaching like that on this piece of, piece of scripture or about the blood and its immense power in the name of Jesus. But the benefit of walking through the Bible verse by verse and reading a lot of it is that things that are complex can be made more simple in their understanding by knowing how they connect with each other. That's the testimony of the blood. Now there's this final testimony of the water where the two beliefs are, okay? So what is John talking about that the water testifies? Well, it's pretty much boils down into two things. It could mean the water baptism. Why is that? 
because we are told as Christians to celebrate two rituals. Sometimes we have a fancy name for them. We call them sacraments. And they are water baptism and communion, taking the bread to remember Jesus' death on the cross and by drinking of the cup. And isn't it interesting that one of those sacraments is remembering the blood? Hmm, okay, you can see how important that testimony of the blood is. But the baptism by water means the following, because we're not saved by water baptism, okay? When we get water baptized, okay, in the Christian life, it is given to people after they have made a decision to follow Jesus because they are saying by water baptism, okay, that they agree with the teachings and the truth of what they've been taught about Jesus. This is why the testimony is about Jesus Christ being the Son of God. Why John said in verse 5, he who overcomes the world is the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then the three things that follow and testify about that, verses 6, 7, and 8, are the Holy Spirit, the blood, which we just talked about, and the water. Water baptism is a testimony that we are in alignment with when it comes to our faith. Now, there's another testimony that is fair for you um, to assume that John was talking about at the same time which was this, and I want to read this. If you remember, okay, at the end of John's gospel, watch Jesus die. And when Jesus had died, and it was reported to the Roman governor Pilate that he had died, the soldiers wanted to make sure that Jesus was dead because their job was to crucify and kill him. So being surprised that Jesus died quicker than the other two men, who were hanging on his right and on his left, one of the soldiers took a javelin, okay, a short spear, and he drove it into the side of Jesus. And the testimony of what John saw when that soldier confirmed Jesus' death by driving that spear into the place that that professional soldier knew would kill him is this. And I want to read it from John 19 so that we understand a second interpretation of the, the water being a testimony, okay? Now the soldiers came therefore, and they broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified, and they broke the legs of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they didn't have to break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with the spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Verse 5 is a personal verse from John who says the following, the man who saw it has given testimony. There's the testimony, okay? So there's blood in this testimony right here. That's why it's credible for you to accept that what we just read today is referring to the death of Jesus on the cross just as much as water baptism. It could be a combination of both, but you're again, you're in good camp. The man who saw this has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may believe. Why would John say that's the testimony? Because John is leading up after verse after the 19th chapter of, uh, the, of his gospel to talking about what happened in the 20th chapter. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Wow, what amazing timing for us to be talking about that. We're one week from Easter. Jesus rose from the dead. Because John watched him die on the cross and then watched a, a Roman soldier drive a spear in his side so that water and blood came out. Let me talk about the water and the blood and why John says that was a testimony. It's obvious why John says it's a testimony. He's testifying and saying, Jesus died because within about 70, 48 to 72 hours, John's going to run to that tomb. See, Jesus' body isn't there anymore in the 21st chapter of John. And the testimony is then going to believe. Then going to be <laughs> any belief. Okay. When we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus in one week, 
you can be of great cheer, friends. You have overcome the world and have the power to overcome the world because the power of the Holy Spirit, the testimony of the Holy Spirit, the testimony of the water and the blood, which changed everything and changes your life. This is why Peter says at the beginning of his epistle and his letter that you and I, we have an inheritance that is reserved for us up in heaven. It won't perish. It won't fade away. It's not going anywhere. It's held there for you. And the testimony is, is that it's eternal. Doesn't that make living this life and believing in overcoming the difficulties of this life something that you could do? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it wonderful how the whole Bible fits together, exhorts us, lifts us up, and moves us forward in Jesus' name? As you go in to Resurrection Sunday next week when we celebrate Easter together, you have been equipped, you have been exhorted, you're going to a higher level. When you get into those church services and start praising songs and singing about the resurrection, I want you to just be so joyful that you make those dead Christians around you uncomfortable because the resurrection gives us every reason to celebrate and be joyful because the power of God was manifested through his son, Jesus Christ, and is given to us to overcome the world. Wow, what a spiritual truth principle. I'm exhorted. I'm on fire after teaching you that. Now, as you go into this weekend and you celebrate really the week that marked the beginning of the final week of Jesus' life, you're going to probably hear sermons about the triumphal entry. Be blessed in Jesus' name. He knew what he was doing. Jesus knew the cross was coming and that he would have to endure it. But he also knew his father wasn't going to leave him alone. And Jesus' testimony was this, that I lay my life down willingly and give it up. No one's taken it away from me. And I have the authority to raise it from the dead. There is no religious ruler or prophet or holy man or holy woman of God that comes close to Jesus Christ, who we give glory. <laughs> May the Lord bless you. May he keep you this week. May he make his face shine upon you in Jesus' name. And share this video, because attached to it is a video on how people can get saved. Imagine that. If you share the video, someone gets saved because of the video you shared, then you're gonna meet him in heaven. And they're going to say something like, hey, Arajan, thank you for sharing that video. I got saved because of it. That's how easy it is to do kingdom work. But we got to do the work in Jesus' name. I bless you.